Okay, we've been talking about JavaScript objects, and uh, last time we talked about closures and variable scoping. So now we're going to discuss a little bit advanced way to use a self-executing function that we have right here to kind of encapsulate or enclose the variable scope. And that'll allow us to um, use a regular constructor function and have uh, something like a private variable if we wanted to. But also what we want to do, the, the end goal would be to have uh, in your main program, you need to still be out, able to access something from inside this closure, right? So this closure is sealed from the outside unless from within the closure, we allow access to the outside world in some way. Okay, so we're gonna just create a, a person class very simply um, and starting with this premise of the self-executing function. So any variables we define out here, so let foo equal foo, should be single equal. Uh, this person class might still have access to this even after this function has executed. So in memory, the scope is still stored and this variable within that scope is still stored because any objects created with this person class may need to reference this variable. All right, so that's just an important uh, thing to understand about memory management and scoping in JavaScript. Okay, so let's get started here. Uh, let's say we just want a person that's got a first, last, and middle name. So one of the things we can do here is uh, use the spread operator and get the args, right? So what this basically does is any arguments you pass into this function, it collects them, however many there might be. All right, and then the next step, this is a little bit advanced JavaScript. This is called destructuring. So what we can do is from this arguments list, right, we can define uh, uh, several variables. So we'll say first, last, and middle will be the third one because not everybody has a middle name. So uh, then we set that equal to our arguments array. Now this is called destructuring. So this is an array and we have the let keyword in front of all of these variable names. So what this is basically doing is saying the first three items in this array are going to be placed in these variables. So you can do this with objects uh, or with arrays uh, the syntax is a little bit uh, unusual if you're not used to it, but I do want to expose you to destructuring. Okay, so. All right, um, <clears throat> so we have these variables and then we can um, say, you know, this dot first equals first, this dot last equals last, and this dot middle equals middle. So what happens if we don't provide a third argument that is the middle name here? Uh, in JavaScript, uh, if if you try to access uh, an element of array that doesn't exist, it just returns undefined. So, so this one will just be undefined and it's not a big deal. All right. Um, <clears throat> so next we can have uh, a concept of a uh, uh, private instance variable. Right, so I can, if I want to generate an ID, but I don't want that to be part of uh, something that other people can access, right? So when I create this person object, I want them to be able to access the first name, the last name, and the middle name, but I want a, an ID uh, that's secret, and nobody else, uh, once you've constructed this person class, uh, the, the resulting object, you can't directly access this ID. I might provide you some methods to, to access it, but you can't do it directly, okay? So this is what's called a private uh, instance variable. All right, so we can do something like this. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna generate an ID is a private instance okay now uh, basically what makes this private is there's no this right we're just let ID basically and I'm gonna set this equal to something in a second but this this private instance um, means anything any uh, functions or any uh, anything defined inside of this function scope because remember this function is a closure as well uh, anything defined in here will have access to this variable. Anything outside will not. So anything in this 
um, self-executing function or anything outside of that will not have access to this okay and it's an instance variable because remember the uh, the constructor function uh, is creating an object alright so this is going to be a brand new object and so this ID is going to be different every single time this function runs okay so every time you create a person we're going to create a new specific ID for that particular instance of an object okay so one of the things we want to do is uh, make a, um, a, a, a generate ID function right now this generate ID function if we wanted to make it uh, it's going to be the same function for every class so we don't really need to have it private if we put the function inside here this would be an instance method right we attach it to this or or here we can have it be a uh, private static method okay so this is um, private because it's not attached to our person object right and it's a, it's a static method meaning it's the same for all instances okay so private static now uh, what do we want to do here this just generates an ID we return math.floor math.random times a thousand uh, a million so so this generates a, a number between zero and a million uh, not including a million um, it takes the floor so it's a random ID um, so again, generally speaking, you wouldn't want to use this in production because there's a possibility of collisions, but this is just for uh, demonstration purposes, okay? So we're generating an ID, <clears throat> uh, and that is private static method. It's private again because nobody has access to it, except when you're creating one of these uh, persons, one of these people objects. Uh, so let's call this generate ID like that. Now, if for some reason we did want to make this a public static method, right? So public means once I've created these, uh, once I have access to this person uh, constructor function, I also want access to this generate ID function. What I can do is I can say uh, person dot and then generate ID and set that equal to generate ID. Okay, so this is interesting and it's sort of unusual compared to other programming languages. Person is a function. Everything in JavaScript is an object though. So what you can do is you can just add a property to the function. So this is an object. The object just happens to be a function object and you can add a property to it. And then that means outside in the main program, we can uh, create a person like this or we could also just say person dot generate ID and we would be able to access this function okay now it's the same function for every single person that you create which is why it's outside of the person function if we had a function that that was specific uh, to the information of this particular individual uh, th that would be um, instance uh, instance methods those go inside of the constructor function. And we're gonna make an instance method here uh, just in just a second. So we say we have this ID, um, but we do want to be able to retrieve the ID. We just don't want uh, whoever's created the person, we don't want them to uh, be able to set the ID accidentally, right? So we don't want them to modify this ID, but we do want them to be able to read it. So what we can do is we can create a simple private method. Sometimes these are called getters. Um, Right, and it's a simple method that we just get the ID. Right, I could just copy and paste this here. All right, uh, and we're just returning this private ID. So in this way, uh, this we want this to be. Um, if if it's a private getter, that's not particularly useful um, because we already have the private variable. What we want is a a public getter. So we want whoever created this person to be able to access the ID uh, for reading only, right? So when we return this ID, they can't modify the internal variable, right? So if we want to make this a public getter, then we have to change this a little bit. We have to say this dot get ID and set that equal to a function, okay? So now this is attached to 
this keyword. This is the new object we are creating. All right, so get ID is a method, right? It allows us on this object itself. So we've created a person P down here. We can then say P dot get ID and we're able to retrieve the data, but we aren't able uh, to change the data, right? So that's the idea of a private variable with a public getter. All right, another public method um, that is an instance method. Uh, <clears throat> so, so first of all, why is this an instance getter? It's because the ID is going to be different for every single instance of a person. All right. So the difference between instance and static means for instance, it, it is different depending on every single instance static. This function is the same for every single person. So we can just define it outside of the person constructor and it, it doesn't matter. Uh, we use the same function for every single person. There's no specific details that are just for one particular person, right? There's no usages of this, basically, is, is how you see that. All right, so this public method, uh, this is an instance method, right? So public instance method. Uh, we do see this. We're attaching it to this object, so this dot to string. We are, are using uh, the fat arrow syntax. So this is automatically going to bind to the outer context, right? So that's something we might want to do up here if there was the possibility of passing this function around. Um, in general, if you're doing this constructor style, you probably want to go ahead and use these. I'm, I'm going to leave it alone for now just so you can see the two different ways. Uh, but this, again, basically means this inside of our method is the same this as outside. So this outside is the object, and so the this inside is the object out here. So that's the special distinction with the fat arrow function. All right, so this to string, we're basically going to construct a string. Uh, we're gonna say this dot first, so the first name of the person that we got up here. And then we're gonna add a space character. If we have this dot middle, Right. If we don't include it, that's undefined. So we'll skip over this step. Um, if you only have one line of JavaScript in the if statement, you do not need the curly braces. Uh, otherwise, you do multiple lines. So uh, if this dot middle add this dot middle plus uh, the space, and then um, either way, we're going to add this ending part. So this dot last, uh, and then this dot get ID. So um, this dot get ID. Now this syntax is um, a template string, and the idea here is you use backticks to define the the template string, and then you can use dollar sign curly brace syntax. What goes in there is a JavaScript expression. This is a very simple JavaScript expression. Uh, they can be complicated, but it's best to kind of just toss in a variable here, and this is out, basically allows you to uh, have string injection. So you're injecting variables. Um, the values of variables inside of a string. So this shows you uh, last name, space, and then in parentheses, right? So the parentheses are actually string characters. And then here's our dollar sign curly brace. And this is another JavaScript expression. We're going to call this dot get ID and it's going to generate the ID. So all this does is give us kind of a string based representation of one of these objects. First, uh, middle if it's there, last, and then the ID number. All right, and then um, what we want to do is is basically create one of these people. So if I do it here, I don't have access to person, right? Person is inside of this function scope, right? So so for now, real quick, I'm going to move this up, and we're gonna just make a, a quick person here, and then we're gonna say um, <clears throat> console log, and we'll say uh, p dot to string. Okay, so that's we're gonna log this out. We need a person. All right, so let's do uh, Ron Paul. So we've got uh, console dot log. We're gonna string. So let's take a look at this. Uh, we need to run our program. All right, so we run node, and this is number seven. So Ron Paul. So we have an ID. Okay. Now that ID is going to be different for for every person that we create. All right. And, and you'll see even it's randomized. So when we run it again, the ID is different. 
All right. So now what we want to do is we want to get this down here. Okay. I can't just run this down here. All right. Um, if I try to run this, we get an error, right? That's because of the closure based encapsulation. This is uh, sealed from the outer scope, right? That's what this function uh, closure creation does. So every function is a closure. All right, so how do we get this out? There's several ways in, in older style code bases, you might see something like this. Now we have module systems and it's a little bit better than it used to be, but uh, at the time of this writing, the module system is still kind of a mess in JavaScript there. There were competing standards for a while. One has kind of emerged as the better standard, the, the general JavaScript module um, is going forward is going to be the way to do things, but for a long time it was murky. And so there's lots of different ways of sort of loading JavaScript, loading modules um, and, and doing this sort of thing. So what we're going to do here is just reference uh, something common that you might see. There's a lot of older code, code bases that do something like this. They might not do this window global thing, but you do have the concept of some, some global and uh, then you attach it to the global. So this doesn't necessarily need to be at the top. It could be at the bottom. It just depends on how they structure their code. But basically we need to expose person to this global uh, GBL person equals person. Okay, so in this way, we've exposed the, the person object onto our global object. All right, now down here, my linter is still complaining as it should because it's saying person is not defined. And that's true, we have not defined in this scope uh, a variable person. However, we did attach it to the global. So uh, what JavaScript is gonna do, it's gonna try to search for this thing in the main scope, in it, or in its current scope, and if it doesn't find it, it's gonna keep going up scope until it eventually reaches the global scope, and it should find this, all right? Let me run that. Okay, and so there we go. Um, it did in fact access that. Now it is probably a bad practice to uh, just rely on the global scope and your, your linter will usually be set up to complain about that sort of thing. So you might wanna do something like this, let person equal, <clears throat> but then you have to get your global again, right? So we have to do this. And let person equal uh, GBL dot person. All right. So now the linter doesn't complain. We haven't really changed things much other than declaring a local variable in the local scope. That is also what we have on the, on the global variable, but that satisfies our linter and it doesn't complain. <clears throat> All right. And then also just to demonstrate um, person dot generate ID, right? This, uh, this is what makes this function um, static, right? We attached it to the function itself. It's public because anyone who access, has access to this constructor function itself uh, has access to it, so it's public. Um, public basically means you have access to it outside of the scope of the definition of the thing. Uh, this example is private. Nobody has access to this outside the definition of person, okay? Public means you do, private means you don't. All right, so here we can run this and we can see, uh, we can do a console.log and we have another kind of generate ID here. All right, and every time we run this, we see, you know, that was, we ran that inside of the uh, instance code. So every time we create an object, we're gonna get a random uh, ID, but then you also have access to this generate ID externally for whatever reason. So that's a common thing to need a static uh, static method in, in class type, object-oriented type code. All right, so this is a pretty, very, very simple example of a basic sort of class type of thing. Um, we're not using the class keyword. You don't have to for something like this. You can. Uh, there are some aspects to the class uh, syntax that do make things easier, but then there are other things that make it much, much more difficult to understand. So JavaScript is very unique in that aspect. It's evolved quite a bit over the years, and there are pros and cons to a lot of the constructs. So.
trying to give you a general view of a little bit of historical JavaScript and then also talk about some of the newer, newer features as well. All right, so one more time through the code. We have a self-executing function, uh, public static generate ID. So the only reason this is public here, at this point, it's not public. It only becomes public when we attach it to our uh, constructor function. Our constructor function is basically like what you would commonly think of as a class in other programming languages. So we're creating objects with this. We want to use the new keyword. If we don't, uh, if we want to avoid having to use the new keyword, we, we have, um, you know, this type of thing. So if it's not a new target, then we go ahead and say new. And that would allow us to do, uh, to eliminate the use of new here if we wanted to. This would be more like, I don't know, in Python, you don't have to use a new keyword to create objects, right? And so we get the same type of, same style of output. Now, there's no inheritance, right? So um, in, in future videos, we're gonna talk about different ways of doing inheritance. Inheritance is easier with uh, the class keyword, uh, for sure. Um, but in most instances, in a lot of instances anyway, you're not really gonna need to use much inheritance. Um, depending on your code base, if it's like a game or something like that, or, or there actually is uh, hierarchies of, of objects that do make sense, um, then you might. But um, a lot of, uh, I would say, object-oriented uh, inheritance-based programming, um, a big part of it is people are trying to force inheritance, like trying to use object-oriented principles when they don't really make sense. So we're kind of at a place in programming where people use different programming concepts like functional programming and, and object-oriented programming use all these different types of programming where they're necessary and that's a much better way to code it results in cleaner code if your paradigm makes sense for what you're doing then do it don't force a paradigm on something else now in practice you can you can mess around with that you can play with that yourself to see how complicated it is to try programming something in a different paradigm and that's a really good exercise that will that will showcase what certain paradigms are, are good at and what certain paradigms are not but in general if you're making something that needs to be maintained something that's in production you want to use the simplest tool the most understandable tool possible right okay so that's good enough that, they, that that shows us encapsulation. We have this public static. We created the constructor function, right? Um, private methods or private variables. Uh, this is a public getter that gives us read-only access to the private variable. Um, we did public static and then exposure. So this whole thing is encapsulated by our closure function, our self-executing function. And so we have to have some way of exposing it to the outside world, so we did that via the global, uh, the global object, right? And then our main program just ran it. All right, that's good enough. Thanks for watching.